All right. Are there any other questions, comments? All right, then we'll move on to 6.3, school closure process online. Uh, online, outline, outline, okay. So I just wanted to take a few oh, minutes, outline. you know. Yeah, I wanted, I got confused there for a second. I wanted to take a few minutes and just briefly, because we at some point we are going, as we talk about restructuring, we are gonna need to go through the process of school closure. And I know that we've done it before um, when, when the Wales school was closed, but there are some new folks on the board and there are some the factors that, that are a little bit different this time. Um, and so I just wanted to take a moment and share with you a few slides about the school closure process because I'm, I'm not sure everybody knows. Um, so hold on here. All right. I've got to move this because I can't get to my present bar. Uh, let's see. There we go. All right. So school closure process in Maine. Um, this, this process is the very the state of Maine has a very prescriptive process for closing a school building. Um, and I think, you know, I've poured through 20A over the course of the last few months trying to make sure I, I was very clear about how this works. And actually, Scott and I spent some time uh, last year meeting with some other school districts. And it really, it's, it's really school district specific, depending on whether you're an RSU, an AOS, whether you're replacing, whether you're closing elementary schools or closing secondary schools. But I, you know, for our purposes, I thought I'd just take a few moments. So um, in, in 20A, there are three reasons an RSU can close a school building. Um, one, the building is being replaced by a new building through a state approved construction project. So for instance, uh, Auburn right now will be building a new Edward Little High School. They can close Edward Little High School because they have a state approved construction process uh, project that the state is um, paying for. An RSU can close a school building if the building has been condemned. Um, and so, you know, let's say a, a government agency comes in and says the building is not fit uh, for inhabitants, um, you can close, there's a process for closing through that process. Um, the last one is lack of need. Um, and that that's requiring requires a filing of a report with the DOE. And this is where we're gonna fall. Um, when we when we make the decision to, you know, we're we're going down the road when we got architects and we make the decision to close the school, we're gonna follow fall under lack of need because our our construction project will not be um, state approved. It'll be a local approved construction project. So lack of need. Step one, um, the combined school board votes to close the school. So what that would mean for us is, is that we would have, you all would have to take a vote to close the building. So we're talking about Libby Tozier and Sabatis Primary. Um, we would need to take individual votes on, on each building. It requires a two third supermajority of the weighted vote. Um, and so, so for our purposes, it, and I just kind of laid out the numbers here um, because I thought, I thought it would be interesting to see current, our current numbers. Now we are going through, we just completed a census per um, the RPC. We, once the census, the new census is out, we will have to take a look at our weighted votes again. Um, I don't, I haven't seen those numbers, those numbers aren't out yet, but once they are, um, the board will have to, to look at our weighted votes. But until that time, uh, currently, Sabatis, uh, a member from Sabatis has a vote of a uh, weighted vote of 122, Litchfield 119, and Wales 76 for a total weight of 997. Um, so that would require a, a to pass, the two thirds majority would be a vote of 665. Once, once that happens, um, I will have to file a lack of need report with the state. And, and I won't dig into all of these things um, here, but they, they are all these pieces that will have to be a part of the lack of need report. I've looked at quite a few of them. It's interesting um, how this goes about. Some school districts write, uh, have written 20, 30 page documents. Others have written three page documents. Um, it just, it really depends on what these things look like. The biggest piece of this is the cost analysis of keeping the building open. Um, so once I do that, uh, once, once that happens, we file the lack of need report, the DOE then approves it. Um, once they approve it, we then have to go out, um, go out to referendum. So what's interesting for our purposes, and I had a conversation with Paula Gravel at the state today to dig into the statute a little bit, um, because I, I, as I was reading the statute, I got a little confused um, and, and ended up learning something. So it, it, 
if we if the building was in a town and and only that town students went to that building then only that town would vote on the closure of that building where we send will be sending students from all three towns into those two buildings all three towns will vote on that so and it'll be a combined vote it won't be singular votes when we close the whale school and and bob will remember better i, I was not here at the time only the town of Wales voted on that closure, correct, Bob? That's correct, I, we only had Wales students. Right, only had Wales students. When we do this, we will have students from all three towns in those buildings. So the way the statute reads is that if, if it's in a singular town, if that town votes to keep the school open, the dollar figure under the additional cost of the school being opened um, or estimated by as part of that cost analysis, if the town, so let's say Sabatis, if we were just, if Sabatis Primary only had students from Sabatis in it, um, and Sabatis decided, the town voted, and they decided to keep it open, that dollar figure would have to be cut from our local budget and directly assessed that next year to the town of Sabatis. In our case, that's not going to be the way that works. If, if we decide not, if the towns decide not to close a building, then it would be a wash. Um, and that was what I, it, it would not have to be cut because it would just be assessed to all three towns. It was very interesting. It was actually, uh, Paula said to me on the phone, she's like, wow, we've both learned something here. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna check that over with Drummond Woodson just to make sure, um, but that's the way the DOE is interpreting the statute. And that's the way I interpreted the statute when I read it. Um, so ultimately we would take a vote in all three towns. If the towns vote to keep the building open, the building would stay open. If, um, if the town votes to close it, it can then close. You know, you could run into a scenario, and we talked about this briefly at Finance and Facilities, you know, where one, one building is voted to stay open and one building is voted to close. My recommendation to you all would be take another vote of the board and go back out to referendum again. However, um, I, I, you know, that, that has not happened in the past um, from what I understand. So, I just wanted to take a moment and go through that process for new members of the board who've never been through it, um, because I think it's important to note that it is not just the board that votes to close a school. Um, the board votes to put it out to referendum. It is the communities that vote to close the school. So that, that was just a brief, uh, brief overview of that. And that's all I have. Any questions? Andy, what's the, what's the timetable? So uh, as far as when do we want to do this? Yeah. I think that's probably Robbie going to get driven by what we hear from architects. Yeah. Uh, I, I, there's no reason to, I mean, in my mind, I'd like to do it this spring, but the reality here is we've got to hear from architects first before we ever go down that road. Um, yeah. I, I, I want to see exactly, you know, what, what we can do, what the building potentially looks like, and some potential cost drivers uh, for that building before we, we vote to do that. I mean, ultimately, um, we know that by closing those two buildings, as we heard from Siemens when they did our building analysis, that we would save over a half a million dollars just in operational costs alone uh, by shutting those, those two buildings down. So, and we also know that those two buildings combined need about seven or $8 million worth of work. Um, and so we know that already. Time-wise, you know, there's a process here. So we've got to vote to close the building at the board level. We then have to go out to referendum to close the building. And then once, and we have to do the architect piece, we then will need a bond to, um, to then do the construction. So those all have to fall together. I would never want to, to marry a bond vote with a budget vote. I wouldn't want to do those two things. And ultimately, there's no, there's, no, um, there's no saying you need a bond vote if you're not going to close the buildings. So those have to happen in succession, but there's no timetable on when they have to happen. I mean, we could take a vote this spring to close the buildings, and then it take a year and a half before or two years before we ever get there. Um, right. So I think I think as we get further into our processes with the architects, I think that will drive the timeline for sure. Um, okay. Obviously, too, we have to think about the bond cycle. Um, you know, we we can't even the bond cycle doesn't open back up. Um, Scott knows this a little better than I do, but we until next fall, 
um, there won't, we'd have to go out. To, that'd be the earliest at this point that we could go out to referendum for a bond. Um, so, you know, I think really what's going to drive it is the architectural work. Once we have um, the architecture firm um, in place and giving us some ideas and presenting to the full board, then we make the decision to close those buildings and we move that process forward. Well, I'm, I'm just thinking time-wise because as things open up, construction yep. start to boom. Yep. And we're going to be in a scenario where it's going to be a premium to build. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and it is honestly, it's it's a premium to build right at the moment. Um, yeah. With the the cost of building materials right at the moment, I mean, just just plywood alone has you know doubled over the course of the last six eight months. So I I think the cost drivers are important as well. I don't disagree with you, Robbie. I think once things open up construction will boom. I think the economy will open back up to some degree, which actually could help us um, with the yeah. cost of materials once material production can ramp back up. I mean, what, what we're seeing now is because of gathering limits and honestly social distancing, right. um, your factories can't turn out things the same way that they were before. So um, I think a lot of this is going to have to drive with the architects. Once we do that, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty pretty simple process to some degree for the board's portion. Um, and then starting that lack of need reports a pretty quick turnaround. Scott and I have already started talking about that and uh, drafting some things. So we can turn that around pretty quick, um, but it's really going to hinge on the you know, architectural firm and things like that, for sure. Yep. Uh, where question? would this yes where would this school be built well we had we had made the decision last year to put out an rfq for an addition at the middle school here in litchfield no nope, or in, at uh, sabatis in middle school sabatis yep okay yeah the, the the board discussed that and voted that that was the place to go or the consensus mm -hmm. the place to go because yeah it has a city water and sewage and it was designed to have a building put on the side of it and connected so yep. everything is there i ready. just wanted to make sure we were still doing that yes yep. yeah that is still the course of action okay thank you any other questions so does both libby tozier and sabatis primary have students from all three towns? Yeah, well, they do right now, um, and they will next year with our reorganization plan. Okay, I, I didn't know, because at one point I thought Sabatis Primary was basically Wales and Sabatis. And it, it, it is, well, it is for the, for the most part. Right now, yes, I would, I would agree with you on that. It's mostly Wales and Sabatis, but Libby Tozier currently has students from all three towns. Yeah, okay. Yep. yep. All right. There are no other questions, and we will move on to the February 22, 